But um, I just want to talk real briefly and have you guys uh, maybe mention a little bit about your experiences um, with our, our trips the last few weeks before we shut down campus. So obviously the first trip was to Blue Tech Week down in San Diego. So for those of you, that, you, know, you guys that did not join us, we went down there and we uh, basically visited with uh, uh, Michael Jones's colleagues and all these folks. Really, I personally uh, find that meeting a really fun meeting and a really positive meeting. Some of the meetings we go to, some of the academic meetings I go to, I go up and I give a talk and, I, and, and Dr. A talks about the microplastics and then Dr. A talks about the fragmented wildlife and then Dr. A talks about the, oh, there's this pollution and oh, and then he talks about, right? And so that's an important thing. That's a useful thing. We gotta know what the problems are. Um, but this meeting in San Diego was, wasn't about that. Well, a little bit about that, but mostly it was about solving stuff. So this was with um, Wall Street bankers, um, the head of the United Nations, uh, the, the, the head of NOAA was there, our state controller there, the, the, head, the top fiscal officer in the state of California was there, all these big movers and shakers, and a gazillion million startups, startup companies. So virtually nobody talked about sustainability. Virtually nobody talked about overfishing. Virtually nobody talked about climate change because everybody understands it. There was, there was no reality distortion field in effect at this meeting. It was more, yes, we understand we're taking too many fish. Yes, we understand we have microplastic pollution. Yes, 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 yes. Check, now let's solve it, right? And so there's all these different uh, companies and approaches and collaborations to solve stuff. So, that, so we didn't so much talk about sustainability because everybody's like, we gotta be more sustainable in terms of money, in terms of resources, in terms of food, in terms of whatever, water, whatever. So it's, it's very fun to be in an environment like that where we don't have to be constantly defending reality and constantly defending basic facts. And so uh, that's my take, that's my take. But I wanna hear from you guys that went. So tell me, tell me what, you guys, uh, what you guys thought about those of you guys that were on the Blue Tech trip. Anybody? We ate an algal lunch, that's right, yeah. So Tara had a good time. Who else? Who else went and had a want to say go or whoever? Yeah, Brian. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had a really good time. We we were the only undergrad group there, right? Yes. Uh, so I was th I think thinking about that. I felt very lucky to be there. Um, it changed my outlook on uh, like finance and how we support these like good solutions that we have for the environment. Um, so it made me want to pursue like going into finance and getting rich, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but because like all these people are there and they all run, they're all CFOs and CEOs of these companies and they're all trying to get money to do these really cool things. And I think that's uh, what the majority of us here want to do too. We want to do good for the planet and for ourselves. Um, but yeah, they're doing it with through money, through financing tech. Um, it was really cool. So it, also, yeah, we got to meet the director of the UN of Environmental Programs. Mm -hmm. So that was like pretty wild. Um, really cool trip. You guys should go. Cool. Somebody point. else. Ryan. Uh, I just thought it was interesting because we hear a lot about how the government is making policies and how those policies are going to like affect industry in the future. So I thought it was cool to like see how the industry is making its own, like its climate change or combating climate change isn't necessarily a public or a government issue. It's more of how the private sector is going to push that. Mm -hmm. How the private sector is involving and pushing climate change, some, sometimes more than government policies. Right. Change, right. So really cool. Anybody else? Any other attendees want to chime in? No? Yeah. Talk with a lot of the policymakers, like people who were from different countries, 
as well. There was um, one from Norway and then right. one from Portugal. Right. And one from Baja, California. But it was, they were all having this open discussion of how their countries or their state has participated in making like an ocean policy and everything and how, um, like helping each other out basically. Right. How Uh, sure. Uh, something else that was really cool was that um, talking to all these people, like, I think most of us knew just as much as they did. And so it made me realize, like, we could have their jobs. Was, uh, not like we're competing for it, but <laughs> not a competition. It's true. Yeah, so a lot of these guys are a lot of these guys are coming from a relatively, you guys have a much broader background, I would say, than most of the uh, folks there, they were like an engineer that worked on this and then that became this or you know, what have you. And so uh, not dumb people or anything like that, but, but they don't necessarily have the background that you guys have in a little bit of policy, a little bit of field methods, a little bit of global perspectives, a little bit of that. Um, so yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, so so that, was the, that was the meeting. And so uh, when I, I, I need to organize these better, so I'll put on a web page so they're organized. But, I welcome you guys, uh, even just now, to start going and watching these, uh, these videos. Um, uh, so we have videos that you guys produced, and then there's other just snippets of, of things that are up there. So for example, um, hmm, what do I want to show? The what? The what? <laughs> I don't, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking, where's my, uh, where? Um, where is the walking around one? Here. So I'll just start with, th with this one real quick. Um, and so I'd like you guys to watch these. Most of them are pretty short, so they don't take a lot, lot, lot of time. So this is the, um, so this is uh, walking into the, the, we, we had meeting rooms and then we had sort of a, a get together room where we had meals and stuff and people had exhibits and stuff. So that's what this is. So when you watch this one, you can go through and you can, you can spin it and you can look at the different uh, displays as we walk by. Um, so obviously a lot of robotic technologies, et cetera. Um, but, but there's uh, one of the things I would encourage you guys to go to in the future is you guys leave your um, as, as you guys leave school and go into the career world, sometimes uh, these things, these get-togethers, these meetings, these professional meetings, whether they're academic or industry or whatever, these are actually really, really useful. And so, um, uh, who, who, had, who had some good contacts? Who, who met some people that were useful for their capstone or useful for maybe a job or something? Just two of you guys? Oh man, you're just proving my, oh, oh sorry, a half hand up or something? Oh, okay, there you go, okay, so good. So, so one of the main values of getting together is, I mean, so one is obviously getting information. So, so obviously it, it, you're getting information, what's going on, what, what's the latest research, what's the latest thing with the industry or what have you, and that's really important. Although these days with things like YouTube and web pages, it's a bit easier to, to get at least some of that. It's still, e it's still best to do that in a meeting where everything's all com you know, packaged for you, delivered, organized, you know, that kind of thing. But the one thing that you, we still can't beat with these meetings is the networking opportunity. Is the, is the meeting a person, chatting with him or her, getting their business card, getting their this, and then, so one, just meeting people, but then two, especially at this meeting, just chatting over a beer or a cookie or an algal ice cream or whatever the heck it was, right? And then that's where you start chatting. And so some of the things that have come out of this, so any, any collaborations come out of this for you guys? Any, anything helpful for Capstone or anything else? So what, what, what came out specifically? We had help from the URC people. Um, they helped us figure out a way to make things like all of our 
So a logistical thing. So sort of a technical expertise help. Okay, good. Anybody else? Yeah, okay, so, so, so there's some technical expertise, there's some connections for information that you can't easily find maybe, and maybe some connections for, for, for post-meeting, uh, 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 connecting, and, and, and when you have a question, place to get more information. Cool, anybody else have any, any good things? So we might be getting some more technology out of this meeting from some talking with some folks. So some people might want to come down now and t put some of their stuff out on Santa Rosa and, and things like that. Some, some camera technology, some robotic technology. That's cool, right? And that all comes from sitting and talking to people, right? And, and just, in one sense, uh, shooting the breeze uh, with them and, and just talking and, and you don't necessarily know where, it, what, where it's going to lead. And a lot of times it doesn't lead to anywhere, which is fine. But if you don't do this, you know, it, might take, it might take 20 conversations to get one or two that are really helpful. And that's cool and that's understandable. So not every conversation has to lead to someone giving you something or getting a job or whatever. But if you don't start that conversation, you're not going to get to the 20th one. You know what I'm saying? And so so these, these meetings are really, really helpful for that. Okay. So we have some like overview videos like this, and then obviously you guys you guys produced uh, your your various videos. So some were like like this that were focused on a single uh, theme. In this case, this is this uh, gentleman who's showing off this new little drone, and so this particular video is very tight. Others others are more like I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, what's one that's well, so, so, okay, so, so here's an example of one of the panels. These guys are talking about financing. So, so in this case, it's Michael Jones asking the questions and then the different panelists are giving their responses. So it's a bit more of a you know, state of affairs of this topic and getting input from various folks. So, um, so that was cool. That guy second on the left. This guy? Works for Rockefeller a Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. Right, right, yep. Yes, gazillion billion dollar mutual funds and things like that. Um, okay, so that was, that was what we were, were doing and, and all that kind of good stuff. Then, the, obviously we had the craziness of all the world started to go crazy while we were there. Um, but a, a subset of us, um, so most, a lot of folks uh, ran home understandably to go see if their house was okay and see their friends and all that, all that understandable stuff. A small subset of us stayed we did a couple things. We couldn't do everything we wanted to do. The border was getting crazy, so we couldn't. Our planned border visit got uh, uh, the federal administration um, does not like you to go visit your border is the short answer. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, but one of the things we did was we went and visited this place. And so I, I do want you guys to watch this whole video. This will be one of the ones I want you to watch all the, and again, most of these, I want you to watch most of these videos. Most are short, a couple minutes, no problem. A few of them are longer. Um, and this is one of the longer ones I, I'd like you guys to, to watch. So um, this is solar turbines. They make all these big uh, uh, gas turbines that go in oil and gas production, but also in ships. And so these are what these turbines look like. And so they, um, they are manufactured here in the US. Man they manufacture their stuff in San Diego. And uh, are they using natural gas? Yes, they're using natural gas. Isn't that a fossil fuel? Yes. Does that make carbon emissions? Yes. But they're specifically, one of their main emphases is on long haul shipping and, uh, th and things like uh, uh, cruise ships and stuff. The two things we can't solve right now. A whole lot of stuff, if someone, someone held a, I don't want to use that analogy. If somebody, if somebody forced us to right now say, solve this problem in terms of like, don't have any more carbon emissions from your vehicles, we could do that in six months, right? It would be expensive, but we could do that for your car, for your motorcycle, for that kind of stuff. The things we cannot solve right now are the are air, air travel and long haul shipping. Um, we don't have a substitute for the energy dense liquid fuels for the, the diesel fuel or the jet fuel powered, powered vehicles. 
solar turbines is a transition, very, in a very real sense, can be considered a transition technology. So they're still using fossil fuels, but they're using gas. They would, this technology replaces the heavy, ugly, disgusting, very, very dirty bunker fuel, you know, horrible emission associated engines that power global trade, et cetera. So is this, the, is this the technology we'll be using 100 years from now? No way. But this could be a bridge, this very much so is a bridge technology for who knows, 10, 15 years kind of thing as we transition to other fuel sources. Um, and so we went on a tour of their, of their plant, their manufacturing plant, which was awesome. Unfortunately, for security reasons, we couldn't film inside their, their manufacturing facility. So what this video is, is our, our, our tour guide um, uh, is giving us the overview. So we are, I recorded this part, so we started describing what they're doing, et cetera. And then we, we go on a little bit of a walk around. At some point we go on a little bit of a walk around. At some point. We go on a little walk around. And then we go visit. Um, so one of the things they're doing is, is they're also prototyping these battery storage facilities so we can create uh, energy storage so that we can use things like wind power, solar, etc. and time shift the demand. And so this part, and so that he walks us through this particular technology, which is a subset of their overall technology. After this, we walk into that build, big building behind him and then we couldn't film anymore. So this, this will give you a, a sense of it, but, but unfortunately we can't show you the tour. But so we saw that, we saw uh, a coastal industry manufacturing. Then we went down to San Diego, and then we went down, excuse me, to uh, South San Diego Bay. And uh, uh, like this. And so we were looking at these salt ponds that, um, that uh, this is a big mound of salt that's being generated. Uh, so, th so these salt ponds over here were historic wetland. They're diked many, many decades ago. And then they're used to flood with salt water, allow the salt water to evaporate, right? The water to evaporate and the salt's left behind and you scoop up the salt. So I have a couple of videos I want you guys to watch that just sort of talks about that. So this is uh, now owned by a friends group uh, for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and over the next few decades, we'll be restoring all this area to, to salt marsh, to, to intact, robust coastal, uh, high quality coastal uh, habitat for things like clapper rails and tidewater gobies and things like that. So we did that, um, and then and then again we were going to go to the border next, but that that got canned. But so so check those videos out; those are pretty cool. Um, then next week we went up to Central California, and so um, there we went. We did three things. We went to um, uh, the Elephant Seal Haul Out at, at Piedras Blancas, just a little bit north of San Simeon. Then we had a long visit with Caltrans initially right there and talked about the realignment of PCH. And then we went up to the Mud Creek Slide, which is now being shut down as we speak for 48 hours because of the rain coming in. So this is the landslide on, on, Big Sur, on PCH on Big Sur that shut down connection. Just opened up a couple months ago. So we, we got to go down there and it was pretty cool. And, uh, and so I want you guys to watch those videos and see what, see what happened there. It looks like this. Um, so we are down, we are actually, yeah, so we're down here. So here's PCH, we're down below and they're just starting to hydro seed. They're just finishing up the project. So this is the last step, putting, putting vegetation on there to stabilize the slope. Um, and, and PCH is being closed because um, this whole thing is just built on a landslide, right? This, this whole side up here all fell, came down onto the, into the ocean. Uh, summer, uh, two winters ago. And so, um, so we got to check that out. And the reason they're shutting it down with these rains is simply because it's not been through any rains yet. So the last rain, last week they shut it down. They're shutting it down now. And they'll probably do that for the foreseeable future until they're confident that stuff is stabilized. But the reality is this landslide is still sliding, right? And so they want to make sure that it's, it's safe enough for people to go across. Um, so, this, so, so, so this is what it looks like when we're driving there. Um, we have a couple videos. We have a regular video like this. We have a 360 video where you can look at all the pompous grass, all the non-native grass, that, that, this, this bunch grass that is... Actually, let's look at a different one. 
Uh, where is the So this this one this one's much better. So so uh, higher quality video. So you can see all these are all these non-native um, plants from the, the the Patagonia area, the pampas of South America, and how they've really invaded our our coastal strand. So we talked a little bit about that on the drive down. And if you watch the video, we just drive down, and then we eventually. eventually get to the okay so, so we're coming up to it here I think and so we come up and so again this is this is the the roadbed of PCH and then um, and then here so this is the part you can't go to as, a, as Joe Blow Public this would be closed so we drove down and so all this thing to the right is the is the stabilized landslide that um, and so we had our tour at the, at the toe of this at the bottom of this at the, at the base of this So pretty crazy. This whole thing is just this big giant landslide. They just built a road on top of the landslide. Yep. Well, this cost forty million dollars. So to do something more robust would have been three, four, five times that price, and it's not clear that would have been any better. So. So this is, this is the option when we live in a eroding cliffside with a freeway that was built in the 1930s. That's sort of the challenge. But we talked about all those things. We talked about the things that, that, that uh, Caltrans deals with and, and the challenges they face, et cetera. So check out those videos. Um, before we did that, we actually met with, um, we met with these guys. Um, and so, so we talked about how, P how Caltrans is pulling back PCH from the shoreline that was eroding. So this part right here was the old roadbed. So this, see how the road's all er eroded and gone? This was the old PCH alignment. And then they've just put it over farther to the right, more inland. And so you can watch those videos and we talk a little bit about the, what they did, um, how we're trying to restore it, et cetera. But um, uh, another project that sounds, oh sure, we should do that, yeah, no problem. Again, tens of millions of dollars in years and years of permitting, so we have all these endangered frogs and and, and wetland habitat and sensitive, sensitive communities and all this kind of stuff here. So, um, so check those videos out, those are pretty cool. Do you, do you guys want to, anybody want to say anything about those stops? Done. Yeah, well there's two, there's Cordadaria Jabata and Cordadaria Celuana, but, but you can just say Cordadaria. Oh, okay. or, or the common name is Pompous Grass. Yeah. Uh, by the way, where do we put our videos? Uh, I'll show you guys after this. I'll show you guys after this. Okay. So the get people that have already tur turned in your videos, I've uploaded them, so they're in this list. But but the folks that have yet to give me their videos, once you give them to me, I'll, I'll upload them tonight or tomorrow, whenever you, you finish them. Um, okay. We actually started off at the Elephant Seal Haul Out, which is which is this site, but that might not be the best video. Where's the best video? Maybe this one's a good one to watch. So this is this is uh, where these northern elephant seals are coming off. Uh, out of the water and so this is an overview area, a viewing area. We went to check it out so we heard about the ecology of these critters and then we also heard about the management. So these guys started showing up in the late, in the uh, mid 90s and then started causing problems. You don't have to hear me talk. Um, and uh, <coughs> you Thank you. essentially we're about to become roadkill because these elephant seals started crawling up onto PCH, right? And that's not a safe situation. One, for just hitting cars. Two, when you have all these really attractive megafauna right next to the road, everybody was stopping and getting out of their cars on the freeway, right? Also not safe. So what these guys did, this is a friends of group, a nonprofit, they, they facilitated work with state parks and, and so the private landowner there, Hearst Corporation, and they essentially created a little they got some public land and they made a, a pull out. They made a, an area where it's safe for everybody to pull out, check it out, and, and see the elephant seals. And so we talked about the management of that. And so in those videos, there's a little bit of talking about um, how, how we did that. Um, but that this is, so Hearst Castle is 
it depends on the year, number one or number two most visited attraction in California. I'll say that again. Hearst Castle is one is the or close to the most visited attraction in term, measured by the number of visitors in the state of California each year. So Disneyland is the other is the other one that sort of competes for it. Um, and so this is right outside that. So there's millions of people that come through this overview area each year. So that's a huge amount of challenges. So we did that. And the last one we did, the last stop we had on the trip was, 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 um, uh, these guys. So this is the, the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse. And so this is Piedras Blancas is over here to the right. This is Julie, the director. This is a Bureau of Land Management facility, which is kind of weird because we think of BLM land as big, wide open Wyoming and Nevada and grazing lands and that kind of stuff. So they actually um, manage the California Coastal Monument. What's that? Yep, I know, weird, but uh, it was created by, um, it was codified by President Obama, and it's essentially this collection of offshore islands and kind of sort of mismatched things on the coast, and one of them is this old. Uh, a lighthouse facility. So in this case, they're interested in preserving both the ecological conditions of the site and the human history of the site and interpreting that. But we typically think about that as something like state parks, national parks. So in an, an agency like BLM that's not used to doing this, it's kind of weird, particularly now with the, our current administration that sees public land as something to open up and have more and more and more and more and more people come and use and consume and drill and all that kind of stuff. And in this case, this is a sensitive habitat, right? You can't have a thousand million people go up to the lighthouse because it won't be an intact lighthouse anymore. So we talked about those things. So anybody want to chime in about anything? Anybody that went on those, any of those stops that want to give some perspective or say what you guys thought was cool about those, those stops? Parker. Um, I thought it was cool. I went to the, the landslide that was so gnarly that it like, created black sand beaches. Yeah. Yeah, we have our we have black sand beaches in California now. Thanks, landslide, because <laughs> of the underlying geology of the rocks that came out. It, it's it's black instead of you know light beige or red or any of our typical colors. It was cool talking to the biologists too. Mm -hmm. All the complexities of movies, mm -hmm. just around elephant scenes and all that. Totally. Yeah, John. In yeah, pompous grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so horrible. Yeah. Like they look. Like, I swear. I just want to like rub my face in it, but that'll spread the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so weird. Yes. Yes. Why are they so bad? Because they so like they have like thousands and thousands of seeds per plant. They feel like they, they don't care. You can't get rid of them. The seeds. They, it just shits all over the place. Like you can't yeah. get rid of it. It grows everywhere. And then because we're fucking up the. The, the mountains so much, they just all the native stuff like oh landslide I'm gone and that shit just went like, out oh, is great. No one's here. Mm. Oh wow. Time to dance. Mm. Terrible. There you go. Like, like what all you right. saw for like the two seconds, like I I was recording like in my car the whole time. I was recording. It was terrible. Like, the entire time. There's just these fluffy things. Every, like, it, I, I can't, it's so Mr. Feeney crazy. hates pompous grass, which is <laughs> very clear. Of them. It, very you clear. You don't even see that much grass in the front yard. Like, it's horrible. Is it just on the Central Coast that you grew? Uh, it's all over. Uh, you'll see it. You'll see it in neighborhoods here. And, and so it was first. It, one of the places it was first planted in North America is Santa Barbara. So Santa Barbara uh, folks in the late 1800s actively planted all over the place, and they were a very popular thing for ladies' hats, and then also for. Uh, as it still is, decoration in, in, um, in uh, 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 like uh, floral arrangements and stuff. And so we just planted it like row crops and then it just started spreading. Okay. Does yeah. it do anything to erosion? Uh, it, it likes erosion because it moves into the, to the eroded areas. So, so because Big Sur is constantly eroding, that's why it's, that's, that's how it's able to get in, right? With an intact canopy, it's a lot harder for it to colonize. Yeah, it, it loves the, the coastal air because it's from the Andean Mountains and likes to, It's literally just the exact same place it was, except that nothing has 
Right, the, the, yeah. right. Which the classic story of invasive, invasive species was: it's in a community, it has predators, it has competitors, it has all these things, and then when we take them out of that, it's called. There's different terms like competitive release and things like that. But but it basically is able to not have the parasites, not have the disease, not have the dudes that normally beat it up, and so it can expand. That's the idea. Tara. Okay, so different note. Yeah. Their main problem was the elephant seals, which is like, uh, yeah, so it's right. like the elephant seals are being protected, but they're also kind of destroying the rest Elef of the Erosion from elephant seals. Yeah. I never heard that before. That was pretty crazy. So, yeah. so, I, so we're talking about this site right here. This site, this this area. Oh, this, is not, this isn't my 3D one. I, I, have, I have a 3D one of this, but... Um, Right here, so the, so the ocean's over here. These guys are, are planting native plants right here and they're, and they're watering them in. But this channel is widened by the elephant seals coming up and, you know, and like lay, laying on it and rubbing up against it and it just, a, a little bit of erosion. And then the next day you do the same thing, a little bit more erosion, the next day a little bit more. And so, so the, the chafing and the laying and the moving around of the elephant seals is, is expanding these um, coastal arroyos kind of thing. Pretty trippy. Was it uh, culverts? Is what they had, like all over the area. Uh, they had culverts before, and then they took those out, and now and and because again the road was basically going through here, and then and now that it's it's more of a natural stream, um, and not not contained in a culvert, not not a, a concrete or a steel box, you know. Now it's just dirt. So these guys are like, well, I'm gonna lay on the dirt, and they're just kind of whoa whoa, and they and they cause that toe erosion that then causes the top of the bluff to come down, et cetera. Cool. Any other, any other thoughts or observations from our Central California trip? Todd? Sea level rise there. Is that underwater? Uh, sea level rise here. Uh, probably with the projected sea level rise, sea level is probably about a little bit, a foot or so below here. Something like that. How many different species are there? Uh, went to several different sites, but the, the themes were three themes. So there's elephant seal, which is all at one site. The Caltrans stop, we, we parked at one site and we walked to a couple different sub-locations and then we drove about 40 minutes to uh, the Mud Creek site. So but that, that was all like this part of the same tour. Uh, and we started out at this abandoned motel, uh, the abandoned sort of scary 1950s like <coughs> murder mystery motel. Uh, and then uh, the last one was at Piedras Blancas Light, it's technically called Piedras Blancas Light Station, um, and that was all at, at one site. 